Okay, the recording is on. Let's take a moment just to um, pray together, and then we will get started. Um, can I request somebody just to pray with the class, please? And we will start. Sorry, anyone can pray. Yeah. Jeffina, go ahead, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the class we are about to have. God, we ask for your guidance, your wisdom as Pastor Ashes teaches. Help us to open our heart and mind and listen to it. And not just listen to it, but apply it in our lives. Um, fill us with your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We invite the Holy Spirit. I praise each and every one of my classmates into your hands. Give us the good wife, the connection, and everything that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone, once again. Um, so in our um, class now on... Uh, Christian apologetics, we started talking about the person, <coughs> sorry, the person of Jesus Christ. And um, this is very important because this is the core of our Christian faith. That is, we must know uh, very clearly, uh, without any doubt or question, who Jesus Christ is, his uniqueness that's what we want to emphasize his uniqueness uh, uh, among you know lots of other names and uh, so on and then also certain aspects of his life and ministry especially his resurrection and then we're going to talk a little bit about how to share christ with people of other faith um, so we are now looking at the uniqueness of Christ. Then we're going to look at the resurrection of Christ. Uh, then we'll have a very short lesson on salvation through Christ, what the Bible says about it. And then we will talk about how to share Christ with uh, people of other faith, very specifically people from the Hindu faith and from the uh, Islam or Muslim faith. So that's what we want to cover. Uh, I'm not sure how, how much ground we will cover today, but we'll go as far as we can. I want to quickly review uh, what we did last week in talking about the uniqueness of Christ, and then we will move forward from there. So we started lesson 10, talking about the uniqueness of Christ, and uh, we said, you know, why is Jesus unique? And, and this is how we must understand Christ. And this is how we must present Christ uh, to other people, that he is unique. And on what basis can we believe that and state that? Number one, we said Christ, Christ's claim for himself. So when Jesus spoke about himself, you know, he was very... He made himself very distinct. You know, he just didn't put himself as one in the crowd. He was very distinct in the things he st stated about himself. There were several quotes here about, you know, who he said he he was. Uh, most notably, John fourteen six, when Jesus said, "You know, I am the way, the truth, and the life." He said, "No one comes to the Father except through me." So that is like. You look, this is the only way in except through me. This is this is the only way. Um, when he spoke about himself, he equated himself with God. He said, I am. You know, and that's the reason they, they were ready to stone him. He said, I and my father are one. You know, so again, it really angered, angered his audience. And in his high priestly prayer, he prayed such a, in a, such a unique way. He prayed as being one with the Father in glory before everything started, before the creation of the world. So he, Jesus was no way a created being. He was no way hum, just a 
human person as everyone else. This was someone who always was eternally and who was now here in human form. So very, very clear. Secondly, the Bible presents you know, very clear that Christ is deity. And uh, we see several uh, passages. Most of these are familiar to us that Jesus is God. Thirdly, uh, the Bible presents Christ as absolutely unique. You know, we saw Acts 4, 12, 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, where the Bible is saying, and we will come back to this theme, that there is the Bible is presenting salvation only in the person of Christ and by no other means. So the Bible is not saying, you know, uh, there are several ways you can achieve salvation, you can do this or this or this or this, and all these will give you salvation. The Bible is not that kind of, of a book. As you read through the scriptures, you come into the New Testament, you follow the whole, uh, you know, the development of the whole unveiling of God through the scriptures, finally it comes to this where the Bible is saying, this is salvation only in this person, Jesus Christ. So the Bible presents Christ as absolutely unique. Number four, this is where we were. Um, we, we spoke about the incarnation, the virgin birth of Christ, as being a, a unique aspect of Jesus Christ. Nobody else born, of, born as a human could claim this, that this is God who became man and he was born in this miraculous way, uh, that he was born through the, and he, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he was born through a virgin. But this is what actually qualified Jesus Christ to be that one representative and that one substitute for the human race. So this is what qualified Jesus because he was fully man, in the sense that he was born as a human, but he was very different, he was sinless. He was a God who was wrapped in human body, very different. And that's what qualified him. He was sinless, he was not born in subjection to sin, Satan or death. All other human beings were born automatically in subjection to sin, Satan and death. But here was one human, actually God wrapped in human form, but he was fully human and he was not in subjection to sin, Satan and death. So he could fully represent the human race, but yet he was fully above sin, Satan and death. And as representing us, uh, he conquered sin, or he paid for all sin, he conquered Satan, he conquered death. So what we pointed out last week was, while other religions may claim a similar concept of God coming on in as a human, and you know, in Hinduism we would use the word avatar, you know, God coming, we see that there's a big distinction between the incarnation the Bible talks about and other forms. The incarnation of Jesus Christ is so unique, so distinct, because of several reasons. We could see that, you know, uh, logically, if you say uh, you, there are multiple avatars, they kept coming, kept coming, kept coming, then which one of them actually accomplished salvation? And if one of them accomplished salvation, then what about the others? They all failed. So then they cannot be God. Why would God need to keep coming over and over again and to accomplish something uh, which he could do as God in one attempt? So the incarnation of Jesus stands out very in, in a very unique manner. And so Christ was uh, his Christ's incarnation is absolute, it is complete. Uh, there's nothing falling short. He paid, he did everything he needed to work and he needed to do for salvation. It's authoritative. 
there's no one else who needs to come in and fill up anything that he left undone. And he was so fully supernatural, fully natural. It was God who became man. So uh, we cover till there. Number five, the uniqueness of Christ. His life, work, teaching, and impact on history. Uh, so when you look at it very objectively, here was a man, uh, actually, he was just ordinary, uh, uh, born to a carpenter family, not born into some noble family, lived a very simple life as a carpenter for the first 30 years. He did his ministry for a very short period of time, only three years. That means only three years he actually went about proclaiming his message and doing his works. Just three years. And after that, he was crucified. That means earthly life ended. His life on earth was brought to a close. So he was a man who was actually very obscure for 30 years. Nobody knew anything. He did his work for three short years. And his work was done in such a small area, just within about 200, less than 200 mile radius, in a very small region in the Middle East. That's it. He never, he had no political influence, he never had political office, nothing. He never, didn't have an army, he never, you know, he did none of those things. And all said and done, there, there are many others before him and after him who've lived longer than him, who've had bigger influence, so to speak, uh, in their lifetime. They've done a lot more, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But all of them have are just forgotten, or they're just a memory. But this man, for just three years of minister today, the whole world is, is you know it's it's all around. It's all it's all about Jesus Christ. History was divided around him, yeah, they say before Christ, after Christ. I know some, some historians have tried to change that, but essentially for almost 2,000 years, that's, that's the way it was before people tried to change it. But he became the center mark. His life became the center point of human history. And then all over the world, so, so much has happened in his name, in his name. There have been many in, in the past who tried to completely wipe out the Christian faith. People who have predicted at various times saying, you know, Jesus will be forgotten and some other philosopher will be remembered or some other scientist will be remembered. And the exact opposite has happened. Jesus, the name of Jesus, has just grown in strength and power all over the world, across languages and cultures. And others have just faded off into history. And so you have to think and say, how could this be? How could this be? There has to be something divine, something supernatural in all of this. Otherwise, just think about so many other people. And they've all gone, all faded away. Nobody knows them. But here Jesus Christ is just growing, I would say, increasing in strength and influence over the world. So this is unquestionable. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a nice little prose that was written a long time ago, 1926, by uh, James Helen Francis. Beautifully written. Uh, I just kind of adapted it a little bit to include his, uh, some, of the, uh, 
some other aspects of it. Yes, I think this is the one. Yeah, this is the one. Uh, uh, this is the original, I think. Yeah. So nice little prose, just to, just captures very beautifully the the impact of Christ's life on human history. That one solitary life still continues to change the course and affect the course of human history. And there are many others who've, who've recognized that, you know, Napoleon recognized it, that even the armies of the world that have marched under great generals did not have as profound, as deep, as lasting an impact as Jesus Christ. You know, Napoleon said, you know, I, I search in vain, I search history, you know, I can't find anybody like Jesus. And um, another British writer, H. G. Wells, recognizes there's no other dominant figure in all of history other than Jesus Christ. And like this, you know, I'm sure uh, there's so many others who stand amazed that this life, which was so simple, so short, is continuing to affect millions of lives all over the world. That itself speaks to the uniqueness of Christ. Number six, um, this kind of ties into point number four, but the point we want to emphasize here is that nobody else claimed or has claimed to give their life as a sacrifice for the remission of sins. So, yeah, there have been many great religious leaders who have come, they have done their thing, or philosophers, they've done their thing, they've gone away. They died, they died naturally, or whatever, died their death naturally, or so otherwise. But nobody said, look, it, when I die, I'm going to atone for the sins of the whole world. Jesus, before Jesus went to the cross, he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In other words, he's saying, look, I'm going to die, but my death is going to result in the forgiveness of sins. That's, nobody else has claimed that. And the Bible is presenting Christ saying, when he died, it was an expression of the love of God, and God was dealing with the sin of the world, you know, for God, Romans 5, 8, for God commends his love towards us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. First John 2 and verse 2, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. He is the payment for our sins, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. That's his death. So, very unique in his death. So, when he was nailed to the cross, on the one hand, it may seem like, well, the, the Roman government is doing what they would normally do to any person who was an offender. And therefore, they have put him on the cross. But Jesus foretold that, he said that, you know, even before beforehand, the Jews are going to deliver me to the Gentiles, the Romans, and they are going to put me up. For, they're going to you know, put me to death. But that death is not the death of an offender, but it's the death of the one who's paying for the offenses of the whole world. So you're saying, this is what's going to happen, but that's the meaning of my death, the purpose of my death. Very unique. So the sacrificial death of Christ to us substitutionary. That means one dying in the place of the rest of the human race. It was atoning, meaning it's meeting the demands of God's justice. God's justice demanded sin has to have a consequence. There's judgment on sin. That judgment was put upon Christ. So his was an atoning death. It was complete. So he paid for the sins of the whole world, whole entire human race, past, present, future, everything done. 
this, his death was triumphant. I mean, he conquered sin, sickness, Satan. He reversed the consequences of the fall. Everything Adam put us under, Jesus brought us out of. And it's transforming. That means he died 2,000 years ago, but today when we look to the cross, our lives are affected. So when you look at the death of Christ, you don't find a parallel anywhere else. No other religious leader, uh, no other human has claimed such purpose, meaning, and efficacy, a fulfillment of objective in, in their death. Nobody else. In fact, the Bible, the message of the Gospel, meaning the main message of the Bible, Includes the death and the resurrection of Christ. It's part of it's very it's the core part of the message of the Bible. And number seven, uh, we will we'll give time for questions. Um, I'll just finish this. Um, number seven, the resurrection of Christ. So not only is his death so meaningful and powerful? This is the amazing claim about, about the Christian faith, about Christ. He just didn't die. He rose up again bodily. And if you and I have to believe in Christ, really, we have to believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. So that is even more staggering because nobody has claimed that before or after Christ. No other human person foretold his resurrection. And no other faith stands so solely on the resurrection of any person. You know, uh, no religion stands or falls with the claim about the resurrection of its founder in a way that Christianity does, Craig, Craig Bloomberg. So it is so important. It's not like a side piece of the faith, or it's not a small aspect of who Christ was. It is a major part. If you and I really believe in Jesus Christ, we have to believe in the Christ who physically rose up from the dead the third day. Otherwise, if we don't believe that, then we're not believing the Christ, the, the real Jesus. So the resurrection of Christ is absolutely unique. Nobody else has ever claimed that, or no other religion or faith says you have to believe in the, resur the physical resurrection of, uh, you know, whoever. But throughout the New Testament, this is over and over again a very important aspect of who Jesus is. He's the one who died, who was buried, and the third day he rose up again. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 3, in verse 3, he says, This is the gospel. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose up again the third day. That's the message. And Philippians 2, 9 to 11, we know that. God exalted him and gave him, you know, exalted him to his, to his own right and gave him a name, which is far above every other name. So he's been raised up, you know, and Paul challenges his audience in Acts 17. Now, why should it be thought a thing incredible to you that God should raise the dead? You know, why? Why is this so shocking? So this is who Jesus is. He has been raised from the dead. So Christ again is unique in his incarnation, the way he was born is unique in his life and impact is unique in his death and he's unique in his resurrection. Nobody, no other human is claiming these things or has claimed these things. And Point number eight, last one. This is again very, very important. 
and we will talk about this in a subsequent lesson in a short way. But what is so interesting about Jesus is that sal the Bible is saying salvation comes through simple faith in the person of Christ. I mean, you believe in this person, believe in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Salvation comes, therefore, comes as a gift. It comes with, you know, a, a, an assurance, you could use the word guarantee. That means you believe in the person of Christ, you will, it's not a maybe, you will be saved. And it's, uh, it's a gift that says it starts here and now, and it takes on, goes on into eternity the salvation he provides and it's not just some new philosophy but he changes us as it makes us new person and it's not a religion that is not something you do outside just as outward form but he's saying he brings us into a relationship a very meaningful relationship with the eternal god so again in the provision of salvation he is unique sorry there's one more point Number nine, which is Christ transforms lives today. So Christ is not just a faith in an historical person who lived and died and rose up again and has no impact on us, but he transforms our lives. He heals, he delivers, he works miracles today. So it's not just I believe in somebody who lived in the past, but I'm believing in somebody who's alive today and he is changing us today. So, so on these nine counts, we say Jesus is unique. So then, of course, we have to make our decision. In either uh, Jesus was alive, was a lunatic, is a legend, or he's Lord. Maybe he just deceived everybody to believe all these things about him, just a liar. Maybe he was just out of his mind to claim all these things about himself and some people bought into it. Maybe it was a legend, maybe just an extraordinary man uh, just stood out among others. Or he is Lord, as he claimed to be. Or the you know believing the first three, or you know, it makes no difference. But the Bible invites us to believe Him as Lord. Okay. All right, let me pause here. So what we've tried to do in this lesson is talk about the uniqueness of Christ. Be, be very clear about this. And when we talk about Christ. You should talk about him in this manner as somebody who is so unique. And like I mentioned last week, in some areas, uh, people have it drawn, I'm talking about Christians, have it drawn from presenting Christ as unique because, you know, it sounds or it's uh, it seems being. Uh, very dogmatic, seems being uh, very uh, unaccepting of other people and so on, for whatever reasons. So they don't come out and say, you know, this is who the Jesus is when they are asked on the question. They just present, uh, you know, a, a Jesus who is okay, one in the crowd. But the Bible is very clear, he's unique. And so the Jesus we believe in and the Jesus we present must be this unique Jesus. Let me pause here, take questions, any, if there are any, from those in class. Any questions? Everybody's okay? Yes, Pastor, we are very much okay. Okay. So, I see Jeffina's question. So, interesting question. So Christ, before his incarnation, didn't have something he has 
after he came, after his incarnation, death, and resurrection. He has a body, but the body is not human body in the sense, the kind of body we have. Because when he uh, arose from the dead, he received a glorified body. So when he told Thomas, you know, touch me, uh, see, Thomas could touch him, of course, but that same body passed through the walls. That same body ascended. So this is what what we I, I just just for the sake of using uh, uh, some language to communicate, we would call it a spiritual body, a glorified body, a resurrected body. So it is made up of a different material than our human body. Our human body, uh, flesh and blood, it will decay. You put it in the ground, it will decay. But not so with the spiritual resurrected body. And the good news is, all of us are going to have that same body after we are raised from the dead. That means, you know, John says, First John chapter 3, verse 3 says, when we see him, we will be like him. You know, our bodies will put on immortality. Our bodies will become these resurrected bodies. So today, Christ is in heaven with this resurrected spirit, glorified body. It's a different material. It can travel like he ascended. It, you know, it went up. It came through the walls. He suddenly just disappeared when he was walking with the two disciples. Suddenly just disappeared. So, uh, but he has that body and we will all have that in the resurrection. Good. Um, Elisha's question, what body will the condemned in hell possess? <coughs> so, we don't know for sure, Elisha, but we know from Scripture that the spirit and soul, that the inner person, is condemned, sent to hell. Now, as soon as they die, and so there is torment, they're already feeling that. Then there is going to be the resurrection of the dead. I mean, everybody, this is in Revelation 20. Everybody will, who's ever lived, the sea will give up the dead. Every, you know, everybody's going to stand before God. And there is the great white throne judgment. And uh, there will be the separation of the sheep and the goats, you know. The, the, and there will be those who are sent away eternally to the lake of fire. In what kind of uh, body will they go? Revelation 20 doesn't specify, doesn't state it. So we are not very sure. But what we can say is it is something that that still causes them to experience eternal torment. Because Jesus talked about and they'll be weeping and gnashing our teeth and so he's using that language to tell us that uh, it's a place of torment, it's a place of pain, separation. Uh, but we don't know exactly, you know, uh, what what form. So uh, I don't want to speculate uh, because uh, it doesn't tell us clearly. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Any other questions? All right. We now go to our next lesson, which is about the resurrection. So this is lesson 11. I think the PDF has already been shared, I think. Um, resurrection of Jesus Christ. So how can we be sure 
and you know remember we are here 2000 years later okay and we are looking back at an event that took place 2000 years ago and how can we be sure that the resurrection of Jesus Christ actually took place now of course we can say okay we just believe that's that's true but can we also look at it in a very uh, I would say in a very logical way based on whatever information we have and come out convinced that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was not a made-up story that it was real so that's what we want to do how you know let's look at of course we, we believe we believe that's true but can we look at it in a very um, you know analyze whatever information we have and can we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ can we do that okay so let's take a few minutes just to lay the background um, the New Testament tells us that you know um, when Jesus was crucified on the cross his body was taken put in the tomb uh, um, sorry let's go into the details Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus they were uh, Jewish leaders or, uh, in the in their time, they made a plea uh, from the Roman government or from elders that, you know, can you give us the body of Jesus? So of course, the Roman soldier verified that Jesus is dead. So he checked the two thieves. He broke, you know, just going to the story that what happened on that day. He broke. For the other two thieves, he broke their legs in order to make sure they're dying. They, di they died, came to Jesus, found out Jesus was already dead. He pierced his side, blood and water flowed. It's okay. The soldier said, Yeah, this person is dead. So the body of Jesus was given and to Joseph Arimathea, who took it and used his own tomb that means he had a property that was in his name in jerusalem in a garden in which he already had his tomb which he had prepared for himself he had bought in
Okay. Um, sorry. Um, I had just lost my connection. Everybody's here. Sorry. Um, my connection just dropped and uh, I'm back. Uh, everyone is still here? Okay. Uh, I, 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 at what point did you um, lose my voice? I just want to know where to start from. I did, I don't. Uh, John, uh, when did you lose me? Can you hear me? Um, yes, yes, Pastor. Oh, okay. Uh, so, okay, fine. Oh, I was sharing about Nicodemus Messenger as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, yeah. So the the body of Jesus was taken and buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Right after that, the Jewish priests went and. Uh, uh, the Jewish priests went and uh, you know got permission. I mean, or rather, they told the Roman soldiers, you know, this Jesus said he's going to rise up from the dead. So we don't want anybody stealing his body and then claiming that he rose up. So send a you know put the Roman seal, send uh, the soldiers there. So that's what they did. So Joseph, uh, the Romans went and they put a seal, which is they tied like a ribbon or a rope around the tomb saying nobody can touch this soldiers were there on guard on duty right through and uh, then sunday morning or the third day sunday morning we have mary magdalene uh, along with a few others they are still thinking jesus is in that tomb let us go and embalm. Let's go and, you know, just do what they would do after three days. Now, when they had buried Jesus, the typical way to do it is they would, you know, uh, they would wrap the whole body in cloth and uh, em embalm with spices, which would solidify, or whatever they would do, which would solidify over, over a period of time. So they had done that. They put the body in the tomb. And third day, they're thinking, we will go in, try to, you know, do whatever we can do for the body. So it's not that, so again, so just think, think about, this is the historical narrative that we have. So what we want to do is we want to look at it in detail and say, hey, given the information, can we logically come to the conclusion that this had to be a resurrection and nothing else. So I'm going back to my no the notes. What do we know? And, and this is going to be a simple lesson, but yet, you know, uh, it, it, it just highlights important things. Number one, there was a Roman seal that was broken. That means, remember, we said the Roman government had sent about a group of soldiers, let's say about 12 soldiers. These are Roman soldiers. They are trained military men. And there's a seal that's been put across the tomb. If anybody removes that seal without authorization, that means they are vile, they're going against the Roman Empire, the Roman government. The seal is representing the Roman Empire. And if anybody breaks that seal, there's only one thing. They are going to be executed. And so in the resurrection of Jesus, the Roman seal was broken. That means somebody, or whatever happened, broke the Roman seal. Could the disciples of Jesus done have done it? What we can say is, just by looking at the events that led up to the crucifixion of Christ, the disciples of Jesus were afraid. 
I mean, they were scared. They dispersed the moment the Roman soldiers came along with the chief priests and elders to capture Jesus. The, the disciples of Jesus were gone. Peter and John were following from a distance. Peter denied Christ. Now these same scared disciples would not dare break the Roman seal. But the fact is the Roman seal was broken. Then, number two, there's an empty tomb. The empty tomb, as we said, it belonged, it was, belo it belonged, it was a legal property. It belonged to a particular person, Joseph of Ar Arimathea. It was right there in Jerusalem. Everybody knew. Okay, this is the property of Joseph of Arimathea. This is his tomb. In this tomb, the body was there. So it was. there could be no mistake. The tomb could not be mistaken. Because it was the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Secondly, this empty tomb was right there in Jerusalem. Now, why is that important? Because... Um, Supposed, I'll just make this point and we'll go for our break. Suppose the disciples said, We have taken the body of Jesus and we have, you know, they went away to some far city and they said, You know, we buried the body of Jesus somewhere where nobody can go and verify. And they said, You know, oh, we put it there, we put him, you know, we took him far away, we put him in a tomb somewhere there in the wilderness. And after three days, you know, the tomb is empty then it's a big question mark you know they yeah we don't know where the where they took the body they put it somewhere far away and they're saying the the tomb is empty hey we don't know but that's not what they did the tomb was right there in the city of jerusalem it, everybody knew who it belonged to everybody could go and see it and that tomb in the city of jerusalem was empty. That means there was no game being played here. The tomb was there. So there are Jewish and Roman sources and traditions that admit an empty tomb. So it's not just the disciples saying the tomb is empty. There are from Roman and Jewish sources that are saying the tomb was empty. Uh, and so Paul Meyer says, you know, this is positive evidence from a hostile source. That means these are people who are not like not supporting or supporters or believers in the Christian faith, and yet they say there's an empty tomb. They are recording there's an empty tomb. So this is point number two, that this tomb was in the city of Jerusalem. Everybody knew whose tomb it was. And uh, it was not done in some, you know, it wasn't like, okay, we went off to Athens or Rome and something happened over there along the way, something. No, it was right there in the city of Jerusalem. and. Other his historical accounts are reporting an empty tomb. Okay, so let's pause here. We'll come back and we will look at the other facts and then we will also discuss some questions here on the resurrection of Jesus, how you and I can be sure that Christ rose from the dead. Okay, let's go for a break and we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 